welcome to Naming God, Naming Infinity, Religious Mysticism and Mathematical Creativity. I'm Francis Levy, Ed Decesi and I are co-directors of the Philip Tatey Center. And today is kind of math day, and afterwards we'll be having an opening for this show, The Aesthetics of Math, which was put together by Hallie Cohn and Adam Ludwig. And if you look around at the art, it represents the work of artists who have been concerned with varying kinds of math, kind of uh, e e either, either directly or in kind of in a more subliminal way. And so take a look at the works themselves. A lot of times people come into the Philip Tatey Center and they don't realize that what we do here is not merely decorative. So all the programming at Philip Tatey's is going, even though our tank is dry presently. This particular, f this particular program, the math program, has been funded by the Templeton Foundation, for which we are grateful for a $20,000 grant. We've also received $50,000 from Bloomberg and $14,500 from the Department of Cultural Affairs. We're very proud of these grants because they're a vindication of our activity and they're, they're hard to come by at this time in, in the history of, of, of private foundations and grant writing. But we need support to continue our programming. So uh, uh, if you're interested in anything about Philoctetes, whether it's the journal, whether it's our research programs, whether it's uh, our videography program, which incidentally enables us to live stream programs like this to people all, you know, simultaneously. You just turn on your computer and you see a Philotetes program. And it enables us to archive all programs. So this particular uh, lecture will be archived. And in, in a few days, you can go to past programming on our home site and see it. And people all over the world see these programs. Uh, we have a YouTube site, and there are 300,000 hits on Philoctetes YouTube programs. So this is a very important part. It's like, it's like the horse and the, and the cart. If we don't have the videography, then we don't have the outreach, then we can't get the funding. So we need to get patrons who will support what we do, and we desperately want to continue. We, this is like a kind of a now become a, a crusade for those of us who are here. We, we, we kind of look at ourselves as the kind of a, a nouveau WPA. And, uh, and the, the importance of what we do is kind of instituted by the fact that um, when we give programs, like we had a program here on historical instruments, which seemed like, a, it, like an esoteric topic. And it was, it's, it's interesting. I've done a lot of talking about the fact that Philoctetes is about the meeting between science and culture. But what it really is is, is, is about meaning making. It's about the fact that, that, that culture itself has a vital importance to people and that all types of, of subjects ha have deep interest and can, that have to, that, that our, our object is really to create a, a, an arena in which people can come and examine and hear people talk on things that they either know about or don't know about. And that this has included uh, historical instruments, this included the theater criticism of the 50s in which we had sellout audiences here. Subjects that you wouldn't normally think that would be of interest attract enormous audiences. It's a, it's a fantastically interesting thing for me. So without further ado though, I want to introduce Lauren Graham. Lauren Graham is professor of the history of science emeritus at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He is currently a research associate and member of the executive committee of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard. His most recent book, written together with Jean-Michel Cantor, is entitled Naming Infinity, A True Story of Religious Mysticism and Mathematical Creativity. Other books include Between Science and Values, Science and Philosophy in the Soviet Union, which was a finalist for the National Book Award, and A a Face in the Rock, which is currently being made into a feature film. Professor Graham has received a number of honors and awards, including the Sartan Medal of the History of Science Society. He's a member of the American Philosophical Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. I'm very honored to, prevent, to pre present Professor Graham. As I was working on this little paper, uh, I ended up giving it a, a title for myself, a little different from the title that you've been given, but I hope, hopefully they fit. Uh, my working title now is the, the Power of Names. It's a very common concept in history that knowing the name of something or someone gives one power over that thing or person. This concept occurs in many different cultures, in many different areas. You find it in among ancient and primitive tribes, uh, Islam, Judaism, Egyptian, Vedic, Hindu, and Christian traditions. 
The strength of this belief that knowing the name of something gives you power over that thing, the strength of this belief varies, and there are certainly exceptions to it. Not everybody who names something believes that he or she gets power over that thing. There are many exceptions. Nonetheless, the persistent persistence and historical continuity of this belief are unmistakable. Some writers find it embedded in the first verses of Genesis, written probably over 3,000 years ago. Others believe it to be an intrinsic characteristic of Greek religion. Still others find it to be a central feature in magic and folklore. And modern feminist writers often see it as the reason why when a woman is married, traditionally she's asked to take the name of her husband. In each of these cases, naming something or someone is seen as the exertion of dominion over that thing or person. I will give examples of some of these in my little talk here. And then I will proceed to the role of naming in modern mathematics. And I will maintain that not only has it been central, but that one major mathematician gave this concept a peculiar twist that reflected his deep mysticism and helped him in his mathematical creativity. In Genesis, we read in the first verses that God said, let there be light, and there was light. Think about that logically just for a moment, and it becomes clear that God named the thing before he created it. And the naming of the thing seemed to be a necessary step toward the creation. Then, according to Genesis, in the next verses, we read that God gave man the right to name all the animals and gave him dominion over them. Here again, the act of naming <coughs> carries with it a sense of power, of hegemony. The Egyptians believed that one gained power over a god if one knew that god's name. <coughs> According to the Jewish religion, the name of God was so holy that it was not to be said out loud. A likely reason for this prohibition was that naming God might be seen as an attempt to assert dominion over him and to duplicate illegitimately a power that is reserved to God. <coughs> a related but somewhat similar theme emerges in classical Greek religion. R.M. Ogilvy, a specialist on this, wrote, quote, in Roman and Greek religion, the first task was to discover the name of the god whom the worshiper wished to influence and then invoke that name, unquote. Greek gods seem to be aloof or even maybe a little recalcitrant. They had to be compelled by their names. You had to get their attention. In fact, there are examples in which the prayers of ancient worshipers were not answered, allegedly because the worshiper did not know the God's correct name or prayed to the wrong God. We are told that the name of the deity who protected the city of Rome was a secret known only to the pontifices. If an enemy learned that name, he might use its power against the interests of the city. A specific use of names in order to bring religious power is that of the Jesus prayer. Now some of you may know about the Jesus prayer. The practice of this prayer dates back to at least the fifth century when certain desert fathers in Egypt and the Middle East promoted the view that the ceaseless repetition of the names of Jesus and God brings the worshiper to a state of not only religious ecstasy, but also profound insight into the world. Do you hear me correctly? The practice of the Jesus prayer 
the, sorry, the Desert Fathers was too holy to be powerful or enunciated. As I said, the Desert Fathers believed that they could transfer part of that power back on themselves, gaining knowledge of the world. The practice of the, of the Jesus prayer has continued down to the present day, both in the Catholic Church and in the Orthodox Church. But it's much stronger in Orthodoxy, especially Russian Orthodoxy, than it is in Roman Catholicism. As we will see, the Jesus prayer is a dangerous thing, and the Roman Catholics have been more successful at keeping it under control uh, than the Orthodox Church has. As we will see further in my story, several of the most important Russian mathematicians of the 20th century were practitioners of the Jesus Prayer, and they believed that it had relevance to mathematics. Now, after I've finished my little talk, and I'll look at the, see how much time I've taken, if there's time, I'll tell you a little bit more about the Jesus Prayer. But for now, I'll go on. The status of names was obviously a central issue in medieval philosophy, in the debates surrounding nominalism. Early nominalists, such as Rosalind, who lived in the 11th century, denied that universal essences exist in reality. They are just names. Thus, according to these nominalists, while individual objects such as a chair certainly exist, and the name has reality, chair, the concept of chairness applied to all chairs did not. The most famous nominalist of all, William of Ockham, 1287-1347, developed a more sophisticated position in holding that universal essences are concepts formed in our mind when we see similarities among the things in the world. Now, if you know anything about set theory, which is where we're going, I should already be ringing a bell or two. But by holding that such essences are only in our minds, Occam, like Rosalyn, denied that they are a part of reality itself. These arguments would have relevance to debates much later among mathematicians about whether the sets that they were creating and naming were real, whatever that means. And the fact that Occam got into trouble with the Catholic Church and in fact was excommunicated by Pope John the 22nd, presents a premonition of the fates of several 20th century mathematicians at the end of my story who also get into trouble with the church and some other even more powerful authorities. The theme of the importance of names <coughs> of Rumpelstiltskin. The origins of this story are centuries old. In, in this story, the miller's daughter is bound to give her firstborn child to the unnamed dwarf who taught her how to weave straw into gold. She's helpless in his power until she learns his name. When she tells him what his name is, Rumpelstiltskin, she gains the ascendancy over him. And he either flees or is destroyed. This is an example of how old folk tales get humanized for modern children. Because in the old versions of Rumpelstiltskin, when she tells him what his name is, he's destroyed. He's actually torn into pieces. But in the more modern versions that uh, uh, mothers tell their children today, uh, Rumpelstiltskin just uh, flees, flies out the window, disappears, or whatever, less violent. The power of naming even emerges in normal, everyday discourse. If a mother says to her little son, Johnny, come inside and wash your hands for lunch, the words carry less weight than if she says, John Wellington Brown, come inside and wash your hands for lunch. In modern mathematics, the theme emerges in different ways. 
The great Russian-French mathematician Alexander Grothendieck, still alive, no longer working in mathematics. In fact, he is living in a remote village in the Pyrenees where he engages in mystical trances and refuses to answer his mail, including my letters. Uh, the great Russian-French mathematician Alexander Grothendieck put a heavy emphasis on naming as a way to gain cognitive, cognitive power over mathematical objects even before they have been understood. One observer of Grothendieck's work wrote, quote, Grothendieck had a flair for choosing striking evocative names for new concepts. Indeed, he saw the act of naming a mathematical object as an integral part of their discovery, as a way to grasp them even before they have been entirely understood, unquote. Grothendieck would say that whenever I get an intuition or an inkling of a new kind of mathematical object, or a new kind of mathematical concept, something that no one else has ever thought of before, the first thing I have to do is give it a name. For example, one of his names was Topos. Give it a name. Once I've given it a name, then I can work with it and decide whether it's worthwhile or not, and maybe discard it and maybe keep it. But until I've named it, I can't do anything with it. Cognitive power. Mathematicians also occasionally observe that on the basis of intuition, they develop concepts that are ineffable and resist definition. These concepts must be named before they can be brought under control and properly enter the mathematical world. Naming can be the path toward that control. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, this topic became critical when mathematicians developed whole classes of mathematical objects which no one had earlier conceived. Being totally unknown, they arrived unnamed. There was even serious doubt that they really existed. Maybe they did not deserve names. Georg Kantor, Russian-German mathematician at the end of the 19th century, initiated this discussion when he promoted the view that there is more than one type of infinity. Until his time, most mathematicians and philosophers had accepted Aristotle's view that infinity is a potentiality a single abstraction and not an actuality, not something that can actually exist. Aristotle noticed that if you take a line segment, it's possible to cut that segment in half, and then you cut the resulting half in half again, and you can continue doing this endlessly. As he observed, quote, for the fact that the process of dividing never comes to an end ensures that this activity exists potentially but not that the infinite exi exists separately, unquote. So for, so for Aristotle and for almost everybody who followed him, there are always some exceptions, for Aristotle, infinity was a potential, potentiality, not an actuality, and it, never, it doesn't actually exist. It's only something that the human mind can conceive. Contour radically broke with this Aristotelian tradition by suggesting that infinity is an actuality, not a potentiality, and furthermore, that it can exist in many distinct forms. His first distinction was between countable and uncountable infinities. If I start counting, put the integers. Come on, can you use this one? If I start counting using the energy, integers, obviously, that can go on forever and potentially, using Aristotle's term, uh, leads to infinity. If I draw a line segment, and if I ask you <coughs> how many points there are on that line segment, well, there's also an infinite number. Remember your geometry, a point has no dimensions. So on any line segment, there is an infinite number of points. Now the question arises, is this infinity 
and this infinity the same? Are they the same infinities? And Contour said definitely not. In the first case, the case of all the integers, we can count what we would now say the elements of the set. We can count the members of that series. Do that when we say one, two, three, four, five. But on a line segment, you can't count any, not even two or three of the points on that line segment. So this is a countable infinity and this is an uncountable infinity. Now, if you're a mathematician, you might say, well, now, wait a minute. You can't actually count two points on this line segment, the first point and the last point. Let's skip over that. The, differ <laughs> the, the, difference is, the difference is that this is a countable set and this is an uncountable set. So if these infinities are different, should they be given different names? Cantor's answer was in the affirmative, and he began the process of naming different infinities by different names. The names are called Aleph numbers. First letter in the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph. Now the door was open to the creation and the naming of a whole gamut of infinities. In fact, an infinity of infinities. A new world of transfinite numbers was being created. But should we say, quote, the creation and the naming of transfinite numbers, unquote? Or should we say the naming, quote, the naming and the creation of transfinite numbers, unquote? Which comes first, the creation or the naming? Not so clear. You could get mathematicians to argue about that. Not all mathematicians accepted this invitation into a new world. The French who possessed a very, path, very powerful mathematical school in Paris, divided over the issue. Some of them, for example, Camille Jordan, Gaston Darbou, Charles Hermite, Charles Emile Picard, were very skeptical of this approach. One of them said, this is not mathematics, this is theology. Others, such as Emile Borel, Henri Lebec, and Emile Baer, were at first very enticed by these new prospects and they entered this new world and they began creating new infinities. There are all kinds of them. You know what a function is in calculus. That most of them go to infinities. You start classifying those functions, you certainly get different kinds of infinities. Rene Baer was brilliant at his classification of functions. And they did, these French, Borel, Lebec, Baer, did such important work that they earned permanent places in the history of mathematics. Some of you have probably studied the Lebec integral. Their names are permanent in the history of mathematics. In 1904, Lebec spoke of naming a set, nomé un ensemble, naming a set. And such a set he then called a named set, ensemble nomé. Nonetheless, Lebec was worried about how one should define these new mathematical objects. Were they just making them up, or did they really exist? Was this mathematics, or was this imagination? At one point, he said that an object is defined, quote, when one has named, nomé, a characteristic property of the object, unquote. However, the French began to be eaten away by inner doubts about what they were doing. They were brilliant, but they were very worried about where they were going. This was such a new mathematical world. Were these new mathematical objects, which they were naming real, did they really exist? Or were they just dreaming them up? Eventually, all three, Borel, Lebec, and Bayer, abandoned the field. They lost their fascination with transfinite numbers. There's a story about each of their abandonment. I, I, I'm not going to take you through all of that, but let me just tell you that Bayer committed suicide. Um, Lebec became very bitter. Brel, who was a very ma healthy man, loved his wife and had lots of other things to do, just left the field and didn't suffer so much. But before Borel left the field, he told his friend, Paul Valéry, 
the following. I left set theory because I had become frightened of the mental consequences of continued research in the area, unquote. He felt he was losing his bearings if he continued in this direction, and he stopped. But while they were still wrestling with these issues, several Russian mathematicians, especially Dmitry Agorov and Nikolai Luzin, came to Paris, stayed at the Hotel Parisiana, very near the Pantheon, near the Ecole Normale, worked with these French mathematicians, and they learned the new mathematics. Both of them were under the heavy influence of a religious sect of the Russian Orthodox Church called name worshipers, whose members put a heavy emphasis on the power of assigning names. Intellectually and religiously, Luzin and Yegorov were the descendants of the desert fathers of the fifth century, who had such a strong influence in the Russian Orthodox Church. Yegorov and Luzin believed that if they named God, they assured his existence. And similarly, they thought that these new sets could be made real by naming them. God cannot be defined, but he can be named. The new sets resisted definition, but they also could be named. The Russians returned to Moscow and created there one of the most powerful mathematical schools of the 20th century. It still exists. I'll say more about that. But perhaps the greatest of them all, of these Russian mathematicians, Nikolai Luzin, approached the topics of naming and defining from an unusual standpoint that was more multidimensional than the ancient view that naming gives one power over a thing. Uh, here I'm going beyond the book. Luzin agreed that be defi by defining, that is naming, new mathematical objects, one gained power over them, but for him this new potency came at a heavy price. To understand this rich and perhaps even contradictory legacy or viewpoint, we must examine Lucen's, briefly, Lucen's philosophical and religious beliefs. Underlying Lucen's concept of naming was a deep mystical outlook. In one of his early letters to his new wife, he criticized university learning for emphasizing only empirical evidence and logic. He observed in a letter of 1908 to his wife that he was interested in, quote, another kind of understanding which you never hear about at the university, namely intuitive mystical understanding, unquote. In his search for deep mystical knowledge, he initiated a study of the classics of mysticism, such as the works of Plotinus at the very end of the classical period. Engaging in this philosophical and religious search at the same time that he was studying some of the most complex problems in set theory. He was seeking a way to unite mathematical rigor with mysticism, not an easy task. Luzon spent the entire summer of 1908 reading William James's soon to be classic, The Varieties of Religious Experience, which contains a central chapter on religious mysticism. James, like Luzon, was attracted to Plotinus, whom James described as saying, quote, in the vision of God, what sees is not our reason, but something prior and superior to our reason, unquote. James was concerned with the capacity of humans to have direct access to knowledge, and he spoke of certain, quote, states of insight into depths of truth unplumbed by the discursive intellect. They are illuminations, revelations, all inarticulate, though they remain, unquote. James observed that these insights have what he called a noetic quality. Meaning that the mystics who possess them believe that they are states of knowledge, 
similar to Plato's view of mathematics, where one, quote, seems to dream of essence, unquote. Moreover, James characterized a mystical state as being ineffable. That is, it defies expression that no adequate report of its content can be given in words, unquote. This, this principle that the most important qualities of mathematical objects cannot be expressed in words or definitions was absolutely central to Luzon's thought. His personal unpublished papers in the archives in Moscow, which I have studied, contain a remarkable passage on this subject. Now what I'm going to quote to you is not from any of Luzon's published works, but the marginalia that he made as he was studying certain mathematical problems. It was written about 1915, and this is about the same time, 1415, that he established, together with Dmitry Yegorov, the seminar that became the cradle of the Moscow School of Mathematics, probably the most famous seminar in the history of mathematics, usually called Lusitania. There's another story behind that. Anyway, so Luzin wrote this in the margins as he was studying a mathematical problem in set theory. Quote, each definition is a piece of secret ripped from nature by the human spirit. I insist on this. Any complicated thing being illumined by definitions, being laid out in them, being broken up in pieces, will be separated into pieces completely transparent even to a child, excluding foggy and dark parts that our intuition whispers to us. By, by separating the object into logical pieces, then only can we move, move further towards new successes due to definitions." Unquote. By linking naming to mathematical definition, and by describing definition as, quote, a piece of secret ripped from nature, unquote, Luzin revealed his differences both with traditional mystical views of naming that I've already discussed a bit, and also with Western rationalism, especially the French form so followed by his mathematical colleagues in Paris. According to the ancient Greeks and many later mystics, naming was a way to gain a pow power over a thing that you name. But Luzon believed that naming was a two-way street involving both losses and gains. When one named something, Luzon thought one gained in effectiveness what he called, quote, new successes due to definition, unquote, but one at the same time also lost what he called, quote, the foggy and dark parts our intuition whispers to us. Thus to Luzon, naming and definition are the awkward, incomplete, and inadequate tools that we must by necessity use in order to do mathematics, <laughs> but which fall far short, short of encapsulating the entirety of the objects they allegedly describe. Luzon saw this at be as being at the heart of the field of mathematics he created, which is called descriptive set theory. According to French rationalists like Borel, Lebec, and Baer, one should follow Descartes and, quote, commence with objects the simplest and easiest to know and ascend step by step to the knowledge of the more complex, unquote. But Luzon differed fundamentally with this form of logical reductionism. To him, the entirety of an object is far greater than, it, than its individual characteristics that might be named or described. Dmitry Yegorov and Nikolai Luzon are generally credited with creating the Moscow School of Mathematics, which by the mid 20th century transformed Moscow into one of the greatest, if not the greatest, single concentration of mathematicians in the world and had an international influence and still does. Um, in 1977, uh, the former president of the American Mathematical Society, a man some of you might know, he was at Columbia for many years, Lipman Bears, wrote a report for the 
uh, National Academy of Sciences evaluating the state of mathematics in the world, and he wrote, quote, Moscow probably contains more great mathematicians than any other city in the world, unquote. He went on to say that the only competitor might be Paris, which where mathematics is also highly centralized, and he mentioned the United States, great mathematicians in the United States, but they tend to be scattered all over the place, you know, Princeton, Berkeley, NYU, Columbia, uh, rather than uh, in one city. The story of the creation and early development of that school is told in this book that came out a few months ago by Jean-Michel Contour and me, Naming Infinity, A True Story of Religious Mysticism and Mathematical Creativity. I'm told that if you're just burning up to read it, that it's possible to buy it. But anyway, uh, it still exists, this Moscow school. Um, and despite recent lo massive losses to emigration, the school uh, exists and its products today can be found on the faculties of most of the leading universities and research uh, facilities in the world. Uh, just before giving this little talk, um, I made up an arbitrary list, totally my contrivance, uh, I can't ju objectively justify it, in which I listed what I thought were 20 of the great universities of the United States, you know, Chicago, Columbia, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Caltech, Michigan. I, li I just made a list of 20 great universities, and in mathematics, NYU, Quran Institute. Um, uh, uh, great universities. And then I went on the Google and I Googled the mathematics department of each of these 20 universities and every one without exception had at least one and sometimes two or three Russians from the uh, Moscow Mathematical School. Now one of the reasons that the role of name worshiping in the early history of Russian mathematics is so little known is that it's been condemned by, I'm tempted to say almost everybody, but first of all, condemned by two of the strongest institutions in Russian history in the last 100 years, the Russian Orthodox Church and the Communist Party. They don't agree on a lot of things, but they agree on this one. The church censured the name worshipers for heretically, quote, confusing the name of God with God himself, unquote. And as a matter of fact, when the name worshippers said, as they often did, the name of God is God, in Russian, imya Bozhe yes sam bog, when they said the name of God is God, they opened themselves up to this criticism. The communists, on the other hand, condemned all religious believers, both orthodox and heretical ones, and in the late 1920s and early 30s, they arrested and imprisoned many name worshippers, including uh, the president and the vice president of the Moscow Mathematical Society. The name worshippers seem to have few friends. Not only did the church and the communists rule against them, but most Western style rationalists, hey, I'm talking about me, most Western style rationalists disagreed with them as well, seeing them as mystics. I'm not a name worshipper. Seeing them as mystics. Thus, because of the, this widespread disapproval, the role of name worshiping in the important development of modern mathematics has been largely ignored. Now that's the end of my formal talk, but I'd like to just say a little bit more about the Jesus Prayer. The Jesus Prayer is a standard part, as I indicated earlier, of the repertoire of prayers of both the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church plays a more important role in the Orthodox Church than it does in the Catholic Church. It's also more dubious uh, in the uh, Orthodox Church than it is in the Catholic Church. The words which usually form the heart of the prayer are, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Gospodi Jesus Christ, Sin of Boji, Pomilia Magreshnava. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a, a sinner. But adepts at the prayer often shorten these eight words to just three, Lord Jesus Christ, or if they got good enough at it, just plain Jesus. Now, according to the name worshipers, 
learning to recite the Jesus prayer in the right way was a complicated business uh, requiring several years. There were stages you had to go through. The communion with God that the prayer al allegedly brought involved three stages of immersion. First was the oral prayer, or the throat, the prayer of the throat, in which the spoken names of God and Jesus were the main concern of the worshiper. Then if the person praying was sufficiently devout and concentrated on the task at hand, the prayer would move to the mental stage, the prayer of the mind. When the, quote, mind starts to cling to the words of the prayer, seeing in them the Lord's presence, unquote. Last, a stage difficultly achieved, came the prayer of the heart. When the heart gains spiritually elan and illumination, and the person achieves, allegedly, a oneness with God. The name worshipers warned the practitioners of their prayer not to rush this process, not to try to speed it up, but to allow the process to follow its own tempo. If, a pers if the person praying tries to hasten the final stage, warm blood sort of misfires and instead of descending to the heart, goes lower and can lead to sexual arousal. Thus the practitioner of the Jesus prayer was dealing with a process that if done right, its adherents maintain brought humans into the closest possible contact with God, but if done incorrectly, could lead to sin. This challenge and temptation may help to explain why the licentious and notorious Rasputin, who claimed to have healing powers and who was advisor to the Tsarina Alexandra, was a name worshiper. Now, uh, and he pleaded with Alexandra to get the Tsar to give clemency to the name worshiper. And a couple times he was close to getting it, but she, he failed. They, they remained. Outside. In fact, the, at one point, the, I start, open my book with the Tsar sends the Russian Navy to Mount Athos to wipe out the name worshippers. I mean, there's a whole violent story to the side of this story. Now, some of you, I don't know how many of you have heard of name worshippers before, but if you ever read uh, J.D. Salinger's uh, novel, Franny and Zui, you might remember that Zui in that novel is a name worshipper. And this is the way she describes the Jesus prayer. I'm reading from Salinger. If you keep saying that prayer, the Jesus prayer, over and over again, you only just have to do it with your lips at first. Then eventually what happens, the prayer becomes self-active. Something happens after a while. I don't know what, but something happens. And the words get synchronized with a person's heartbeats. And then you're actually praying without ceasing which has a really tremendous mystical effect upon your whole outlook. I mean, that's the whole point of it, more or less. I mean, you do it to purify your whole outlook and get an absolutely new conception of what everything's about, unquote. I heard that there were still name worshipers among the mathematicians in Moscow. So in 2004, I went to Moscow looking for name worshipers among mathematicians. I was told that there's one very prominent mathematician who's a name worshiper. I could give you his name, but he doesn't want me to, so I won't. But among mathematicians, the name is known internationally. This mathematician invited me to his home in Moscow, an apartment, typical Soviet-style apartment. The walls were decorated with all of the signs of name worshiping. You'll find them in the book if you're interested. And he never said straight out, I am a name worshiper, but it was more than obvious that he was and that he thought that it helped him in his mathematical work. Well, we ate and drank and so forth, and then I worked my way up to the question I wanted to ask. I said, you know, I've, I've heard a lot about this Jesus prayer. I would really like to see someone doing the Jesus prayer. Would it be possible for me to witness someone in that trance? And he replied rather sternly, no. This is a very intimate experience. It is best done alone. 
and you're witnessing it would be considered an intrusion. And then he quoted the Bible to me, Matthew, where it says, when thou prayest, goest thou to thy closet. So you can't see the Jesus prayer. He said, however, he says, I can see that you're on to this and you want some kind of evidence that it still exists and is going on in Moscow. So I recommend you go to the basement of the church of St. Tatiana the Martyr. There is a place that is sacred to name worshipers. I knew this church. As a student at Moscow University, I even went to a dance in it because it had been, it was the official church of Moscow University before the revolution. It is now again today. But during the Soviet period, it was dest not destroyed, but all the religious objects were taken out of it, and it was converted into a student club and theater. That's why I went to a dance there. I had no idea in 19, spring of 1961 when I went to a dance in that place that I was dancing in the old church of St. Tatiana the Martyr. So I knew where it was. So I went to the church the next day, and I made my way down to the basement, and just, you know, looking for stairs going down. I didn't know where I was going. Made my way to the basement, and there were whitewashed walls. It was a kind of typical basement. And I looked around. I couldn't see anything remarkable. And then I saw off to the side a kind of alcove going at less than the normal 90-degree angle, a little alcove. And I walked into the alcove, and I suddenly realized that I was in a shrine. And on the left wall was a picture of Dmitry Agorov, and on the uh, right side was a picture of Pavel Florensky. These are the patron saints of the name worshipers. And I realized that I was standing in the place where name worshipers secretly come one by one to practice the Jesus prayer. I took out my camera and I took pictures of those two pictures. And while I was just holding the camera still in my hand, I heard footsteps behind me and I turned around and I was being approached by a young man who looked quite unhappy with me and he pointed at me and he said vam nada uiti you must leave so I put up my camera and I left now, who was this young man he didn't have clerical robes on he looked like he might have been a mathematics student I don't know who he was anyway I left a year later I was back in Moscow again, and somehow I was drawn to that basement again. <laughs> Even though I'm not a name worshiper, I was just caught in this story. It just was so magnetic to me. So I went to the church, and I went back down in the basement. A completely different place. The church, which is against name worshiping, it's a heresy, officially. The church had caught on that the name worshipers were coming to the basement, and practicing the Jesus prayer and they moved in and put down there a regular chapel of the church and installed a priest to make sure that you don't go into some kind of name worshiping religious trance uh, in this basement so they've eliminated it so then I went to my name worshiping friend I said you know they've wiped out your church oh he said don't worry about that he said they can't wipe us out he said we don't need churches he said, we don't need priests Name worshiping is something that's done alone. He said, anytime you're alone in your study or in your closet, you wish to do the Jesus prayer, Bajalsta, please do it. So he says, they can't wipe us out. So that's my story. <laughs> so I'm happy to try to answer questions. Yes, Rebecca. Um, uh, belief that knowing the name gives you power over it is a more particular case of a much more general psychological phenomenon, word magic. Um, word magic? Word magic. So for example, you know, curses are, are another example of this. And I have a very strong memory of this when I was a little kid. And I lived in a rough neighborhood. And, um, and I once said to my little sister within my mother's hearing, just trying to mimic the kids I heard on the street, I said to my little sister, drop dead. And my mother went into a, a frenzy. And she was a very 
superstitious woman. And she said, this is the worst thing you can possibly say. I mean, she clearly felt that there was a kind of magic in this. And there is, you know, if you look at a lot of the things that are taboo to say, um, and curses, this is a very general kind of psychological belief that words have, have magic. So it's, you know, it's something much wider than a religious context. Um, the other thing that I, I, I wanted to ask you about was, I'm, I was surprised that in set theory of all places, there could be a belief that naming had ontological implications, that to name the thing was to make it exist. Because set theory is, the one, is one of the areas where you can prove, at once you name certain sets, that they can't possibly exist because they lead to paradoxes. Um, so it's such an, seemed to me so odd that of all places, set theory would have this kind of ontological claim that to name it is to, is to confer existence. We know that, this, you know that the set of all sets can't exist. It leads to a paradox, because its power set would have a higher cardinality. We know that the set of all sets, not members of themselves, can't R exist. Russell's paradox. Russell's paradox. So it just seems so odd to me um, that, that there would be this belief. And it, so I was wondering if you could address both of those uh, I think questions. the name worshippers would say, we, set, we create the set by naming it. We find out later whether that's possible or not. That doesn't prevent us from creating the set. I mean, you can create sets with, I could create a set of everybody in this room right now. We could name it anything we want to name it. How do you pronounce your society? Philoctetus? We could call it the Philoctetus set. Everybody in this room right now. I could create the set of everybody who's not in this room right now. <laughs> uh, I could create the set of everyone in this room who's wearing something green. Uh, I could call it green or Philoxetus green. I could give it a name. So um, I could create a set of everybody sitting against that wall. Called it the left wall Philoxetus set. Give it a name. So you can create any kind of set you want. Plus you can create sets of things that are not material, like I think you are, maybe not entirely. Uh, uh, you can create things uh, I could create a set of all things that get talked about that don't exist. W what would be some of the members? Well, unicorns. Unicorns and mermaids. Uh, I don't think they exist, but I can still create a set of them. So, and I could give them a name. So the very fact that you can get into paradoxes, and you're absolutely right, terrible paradoxes, which almost destroyed the field, um, <laughs> Some people say did. Um, the fact that you can get into paradoxes wouldn't, to a true name worshiper, I think, uh, diminish the power of the naming. Because the name worshippers say, that set exists. Whether it leads to logical paradoxes or not is a different question. Well, yes. the interesting is that you name the set instantly as soon as you recognize the process of paradox, you name it. Right? The set of all sets. Ah, Russell's paradox, and you were able to tag it as well. In fact, it exists. It's more popular than most sets. <laughs> and but they're all. I mean, well, contour was. It exists, let's say, in the sociological sense that we may discuss it, and we have a certain power over. It. Uh, it's to your point. To your point. Uh, but but you, if you're if. Not the set. But if. Russell's paradox means the proof that this can't be. But if, you're, if your point is, as I think it is, that th this leads to terrible logical difficulty, you're absolutely right. And um, not just logical difficulties, but philosophical and some people would say theological difficulties. Well, let me create, and this is a, not my doing, it's been much discussed, some of you know about it, the set of all sets. <laughs> Some people would say, that's God. Cantor was so frightened by the concept of the set of all sets that he said that there are certain cardinalities, that's the mathematical term, there are certain cardinalities that are illegitimate to create. And a question that is discussed among set theorists today is how high up the chain of cardinal numbers can you go legitimately? When do you go so high that you have to say, no, this is not real. I'm not going to go that far. And set theorists differ over that. Yeah. 
I read your book, A Face in the Rock, and I found it very moving, so thank you. My, my, my question is, with regard to Luzon and his search for mathematical rigor with mysticism, I, I wonder if you could comment on the fact that Thomas Jefferson, in his Declaration of Independence, was looking to give mathematical rigor to the concept of equality of, of peoples. Uh, is there anything you could say about that? You are way ahead of me on Thomas Jefferson, so I can't say anything about, I cannot answer your question directly for your lack of knowledge. But if the general question behind it is, can this task of uniting rigor with mysticism be carried off, or have some people carried it off? I think that the answer to that is yes. The, not all, I would never want to be trapped into saying that mathematicians are all mystics, not for a minute. But I would assert that there are, have been significant mathematicians who are mystics. Pythagoras, uh, uh, Contour, uh, Pascal, uh, Laplace, Galileo at moments, Arthur Stanley Eddington said, who? Joe Schwartz. Joe Schwartz? I don't know Joe Schwartz. But anyway, uh, <laughs> there have been Herman Weil, without any question. Now, when these mathematicians wrote pieces, which all of them did at one time or another, demonstrating their mysticism, the reaction of the mathematical world, by and large, to them was either to say something deprecating like they've gone senile, or more often, ignore them. That was the most normal reception, is just ignore them. But some of these people are accomplished absolutely marvelous things in mathematics that will forever be in the history of mathematics. And I think that in some cases, at least, you'd have to take them case by case. You could make a persuasive argument that their mysticism had something to do with their creativity. At least in my name worshipers, I think it did. And I think that in some of the, in Pythagoras' case, <coughs> it did, and some of the others as well. I was at a lecture one time by a philosophy professor who was talking about the different levels of reality. He said that if you saw a rope on the ground and you thought it was a snake um, and you reacted accordingly, the snake was not there but that there was a reality nonetheless in your concept of this that, that influenced you. And it seems to me that somewhere in here we're dealing with the human mind's ability to imagine infinity, but not count to it. So the set of sets seems to me to be just another dimension of the, of the, two, two the, the linear thing that you talked about and the integers. It's, it's, in the same realm exactly, so that we think of it, there's a reality in the, the world of the mind. But until you connect it to something material or physical, it has only theoretical application. There, there's something very deep behind this, and I don't pretend to have the answer to it. Sort of like chasing the ladder of cardinalities, all you can do is run up the ladder so far. I'll try to run up the ladder a certain distance. These mathematicians came very close at certain moments to saying that when I name something, I create it. And if you want to get into a very practical mode of thought, you would say that is obviously false. There are all kinds of things I can name that don't exist. Unicorns. I can name unicorns. You can go out and look for unicorns. You don't find them. So you decide they don't exist, but they still have a name. So naming and creating are not the same thing. Good point. But I would maintain that in mathematics, that kind of analysis doesn't work so well. Because when you say unicorns, then you can send out expeditions to look for them, come back and say they aren't there, you got an answer. But when a mathematician creates a new kind of space, or a new kind of infinity, or a new kind of 
mathematical object, topos, whatever. It's not as if you can send an expedition out to look to see if they exist. You can't do that. The, the equivalent doesn't exist. All you can do when a mathematician has created and named a new mathematical object is to see if the mathematician and other mathematicians can do something with that. Can they take that and do something with it that leads to further things without contradiction? Now, my Russell's paradoxes are going to haunt me a bit, but without contradiction. That if you can do something with them, hey, for the mathematician, they exist. So what mathematicians do when they name and create is not the same thing as what happens when I say unicorn. It's, it's, it's the, the, the distance between the name and the reality is ever so much shorter in mathematics than it is any material world we can discuss. Could you comment on where the line is between uh, a mystical intuition, say Herman Weil of a group, say, and his and his, simply his intuition of a mathematical concept? I love the question. I would also love it if I had an answer. Um, what mathematician's intuition is, is probably the most difficult of all questions that get asked about mathematics. The greatest mathematicians very often have a strong intuition that if they go in a certain direction and they name and create certain ideas and objects, that it will pan out. It doesn't always. We could find many cases where it didn't, but it does enough that we have to take that intuition seriously. Where does it come from? I mean, the person is, a, I mean, they're, they're the person who does this and succeeds is almost always, you know, a successful mathematician who's not starting from zero and therefore has tremendous past knowledge, has seen other things done, has senses of which ways to go that might work. If that's intuition, you, it, it, it sort of loses its mystical quality and becomes just accumulated experience. But almost all mathematicians who've done this would say, hey, it's not just accumulated experience. There's something else at work. What that something else is, hey, tell me. But when do we start calling it mystical? I mean, where's the line? The way we usually define, the way we usually define, if you, if you go to a dictionary and you look up mysticism, or if you read what mysticism is thought to be, it is the belief that knowledge, not just mathematical knowledge, of course, but knowledge comes from illumination, from somewhere inside. It's revealed to you. This thing is revealed to you. It's not something that you construct like a mathematical proof or build up in a Cartesian way from the bottom up. Uh, it's something that comes to you. It's an illumination. It's direct knowledge. Whatever that means, it's direct knowledge. Uh, <clears throat> How do mathematicians and mystics deal with uh, physical discoveries. As technology has increased in terms of both particle physics on, on the one hand and cosmology, uh, cosmology on the other, we're now seeing things in reality that we never have before. Like your example about the, the line, and as you say, well, a point doesn't have any dimension. On the other hand, as particle physics progresses, we're seeing smaller and smaller objects uh, with, to some extent, the hope that we're going to see the basic building block of matter. And presumably, that has worked into our mathematics, which attempt to describe reality. So again, when you have these new physical discoveries, what goes on in a mathematician's mind? What goes on in a mystic's mind? Uh, I've given talks about this to both mathematicians and physicists. And although it's very dangerous to talk about group differences because people are all over the lot, I think it would still be fair to say 
that physicists differ from mathematicians in an important regard that bears on your question and this topic. Physicists think that they're dealing with the real world. There is a world out there of matter and energy and they're dealing with it. And your theories, hypotheses, should be tested against that real world. It may, a long time may go by, string theory, we still are, the jury is out on, uh, a, a long time may go by before the community of physicists decides whether or not that theory can be connected to the real world in a way that it should become a part of standard physics. They all, they all, most of the ones I've talked to think that can happen. Mathematicians aren't there. Uh, if you had three mathematicians in the room and if you asked them, is mathematics discovered or created, you'd probably get five answers. Uh, there are mathematicians who believe that they're not dealing with the real world at all. That mathematics is more like art. It's something they create. It's not completely free because it has to be consistent. It can be falsified if you create something and you create a theory and then it falls into hopeless contradictions. Nonetheless, Georg Kantor, one of his most famous statements, the essence of mathematics is freedom. What does that mean? Can they do just anything? No, obviously they can't. But there's a lot more freedom in a mathematician's world than there is in a physicist's world. The what? Ah, for a mathematician. Yes. Okay. That's really good. Yeah. Uh, I was saying that mathematicians think that they can create much more than physicists. And she called me by saying, well, aren't many mathematicians Platonists? Yes, they are. And if you're really a full-scale Platonist, consistent full-scale Platonist, then you wouldn't say you're creating the world. You would say that these ideas exist out there prior to and separate from human beings. Forms, Plato, Ida, I think that's the Greek word for forms, that these forms exist out there and we <clears throat> lowly mortals can have some success in identifying them, but we are discovering them. We're not discovering continents, and we're not discovering animals, and we're not discovering elementary particles, parts of the material world. We're discovering intellectual forms, platonic forms, that they have an existence all of their own. There are mathematicians who believe that, quite a few of them, and some of the greatest. Not all mathematicians believe that. My sense is that um, get to the essence of your Excuse me, we have to use the microphone. Yeah. I was going to ask a question first, and then I'll give it to you, okay? Uh, just um, a question about phenomenology as a kind of a, 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 a point at which these two, the, the spiritual and the rational, could meet, perhaps. In other words, in the, in the notion of description, description of states, you said you used the word ineffability in relation to can, Cantor. Uh, is it possible that the thingification of these states that you talk about, that the that that, that Cantor talked about, the spiritual states that that, that in, in this kind of in this kind of mathematics, uh, could be that phenomenology could offer one mode upon which you could describe states which don't can't be rationally ex traditionally rationally explained. Uh, maybe there are phenomenologists who write and think this way. Uh, the French philosopher Baudot. I guess writes and thinks this way. Um, I'm a historian of science first and not a mathematician and not a philosopher. So, although I'm very interested in mathematics and philosophy, but the fact that I'm a historian of science dictates my approach. When I went at these people, I didn't say, hey, I'll approach them through the standpoint of phenomenology, or I'll approach them through the standpoint of this philosophical viewpoint or that philosophical viewpoint. Well, I was just more pedestrian. I went in there, what do they talk about? What do they write about? What do they do? 
And what makes him think and write this way? And it just became crushingly clear to me that this business of the importance of names was something that helped them get through a crisis in mathematics, gave them the courage to go forward. That, that's my story. Now, whether a philosopher could come in and say, you know, this is phenomenology, or you can understand this best from the standpoint of phenomenology. I'm not saying that's not so. It's just not the way I go. Um, I sometimes get the feeling that philosophers always want to tell me the way things should have been done, and I'm trying to tell them the way things actually happened. But that's probably not fair to philosophers. I have the mic now. <laughs> I sense that it was about, it's about trends. Trends? Trends. That the naming is a pathway to trends. In the Islam, in the, the Sufis, it's Allah, and they just rock back and forth or twirl, and you will go into trance. Uh, Niels Bohr would be the walk. He would just walk and walk and get into trance in order to bring the intuitive into form. It, it may be trance, uh, and, and when you mention Sufism, uh, I, I, you're the first person, I think, to mention it, but it, it's really relevant to this because in Sufism there are trances and, and there are somewhat similar. And it's, even in Sufism, it even has a connection to mathematics. It's another history that I don't know very well, but I'm told is there, certain numbers that followers of Sufism have used. That's all true, and, and that maybe these are trends. But here again, I, what's most interesting to me is not how knowledge is later justified. That's a very important topic. What's interesting to me is how knowledge is created. What happens at the moment of creation? And it's often the case that wonderful ideas get created in what are later judged as awful ways. In other words, even illegitimate ways. You know, there, there's a story of how Kekulé, you know, the French chemist Kekulé, and was the first person to describe benzene, aromatic, what we call aromatic compounds. You know, what a hexagon looks like. That's the story is that Kekulé was, of course, he was working on chemistry, but he was daydreaming on top of an open bus in Paris, and he dreamed of monkeys grabbing each other's tail in their mouths and making a hexagonal, hexagonal form. He said, Eureka, uh, the chemical information that I've just been accumulated can be organized that way. Now, should we forget that? That's ridiculous. What do monkeys have to do with aromatic compounds? Nothing. The historian of science still wants to tell the story because that's how it happened. The philosopher of science is not very interested. Um, I, I, my, so I'll ask my question. Um, I want to thank you for the book, which is an extraordinary story. I want to, I'd like to push you um, a little bit towards a question you've already s s begun to address, which is the extent to which uh, the name worshippers should be regarded within, say, the history of mathematics as an exception or as bringing out something which is, tends to be there but tends not to be there in as blatant a form. And I'll give you a quote from a philosopher, since you just described philosophers as, as, as being insufficiently interested in the creative moment. Um, but this is one who is, in fact, not, uh, can't be characterized that way. It's from a wonderful essay by Whitehead called Mathematics and the History of Thought. And so, just as a context for that question, um, Short, short, short passage. He says, I will not go so far as to say that a construct, to construct a history of thought without profound study of the mathematical ideas of successive epochs is like omit omitting Hamlet from the play which is named after him. That would be ch claiming too much. But it is certainly analogous to cutting out the part of Ophelia. This simile is singularly exact, for Ophelia is quite essential to the play. She is very charming and a little mad. Let us grant, then, that the pursuit of mathematics is a divine madness. So that would be the generalization uh, of the human spirit. And he continues, a refuge from the goading urgency of contingent happenings. 
Well, uh, I mean, I, there are parts of it that I love. The other parts of it that uh, I would shy away from, um, you know, I have to, I think, show my credentials. I'm a secularist. I am not religious. I'm telling you that straight out. So when someone tells, in fact, a, one reviewer of, of this book said, how could these people who are secularists and rationalists be so sympathetic with these mystics? Well, I'd like to think that I am sympathetic with other points of view uh, and try to give them their best run. But the quotation you gave said, mathematics is divine, is divine madness, a divine madness. Well, it's kind of nice and poetic, but why should I buy it? Um, I think that science and mathematics get their impulses at creative moments from all kinds of places. I have written a book here with a co-author in which I have tried to show you how a certain religious point of view, a heresy to be sure, in our opinion, helped mathematical creativity. So someone might say, aha, so you believe that religion and mathematics and religion and science are compatible. No, that's not my point. If you ask me to come up with an episode in which atheism helped mathematics, I could do it. Uh, if you know what Markov chains are in mathematics, they were developed by a Russian mathematician named Markov in anger at his colleague who was trying to use probability theory to support theism. So he developed another approach to probability theory called Markov chains to show that it could be also based on atheist points of view. Who was right? I, I'm not particularly concerned about who was right. What I'm concerned about is how did it happen? And in the case of the name worshipers, it was religion that played a role. And in the case of Markov, it was atheism that played a role. It, I wouldn't say I'm completely neutral. I have my own religious or non-religious views, but I, I, they do not play central roles, I hope, in what I write. Um, I, in, uh, I, the last question, actually. What, what, well, one more, please. I, I believe... <laughs> I be <laughs> I believe that um, uh, Max Tegmark is going to be here this afternoon. I think that there was a, a piece, I, isn't Max Tegmark going to be, yes. There was a piece quite a while ago in the Scientific American about uh, how the, the chanting practiced by, say, Buddhist monks and the repetition of the name of that kind of praying and that kind of chanting has an effect for you as a secularist on the, this parietal, the left or the right parietal temporal lobe which in effect gives you the experience of joining with the divine and it is the, also the same part of the brain that's activated in the out-of-body experiences that people have on when they have thought they've died and then come back to life on the, on the operating table. And I think that perhaps there is a connection between the, the, the Jesus prayer, the repetition, of get, it's, it's that that induces the trance that allows the vision that then can be formulated uh, with the little pieces of the, the secret, uh, the pieces of the secret of nature. So I don't think that the religious experience is inimical to a secular, a secular one. It's just a, a different name for an actual human experience. I am open to the argument that that what that the thesis you just advanced. I'm open to the argument. I, to me, it's, but but that that this happens. I, I, I'm delighted, but I'm open to the argument that this even helps in creativity. In fact, I wrote a book about it. I would get skeptical and resistant to the argument, although I hope I'm still open to the evidence, but I would get skeptical and resistant to the argument that you can make a blanket statement that we'd all be better scientists if we all did the Jesus prayer. I just don't believe that. I think that the, I think the evidence is out on that, and what evidence is in is negative. So. Um, I'm a long way from recommending that all of our mathematicians, physicists, and chemists uh, be uh, Jesus prayer practitioners. I think that would be ridiculous. <laughs> if they want to come to it on their own, fine. It's a matter of access to the other. Well, I think that the, 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 the,
Uh, yes, I do. Um, it seems like uh, p the big question is, what is mathematics? And by that I mean, uh, it's not science. It may be the language of science, but it's something else again. And it seems like it turns in or it, important points of what you said about mathematicians saying that mathematics represents freedom and also the comment about it being divine madness. And what I'm saying is that perhaps mathematics, which as you indicated, does not necessarily re relate to reality, as the, ph phys the physicists would say. It, it's closest to being an art. And the mathematical process is the creative process, the imaginative process, a secular or a religious or a mystical process that is really akin most of all to what art is and human creation rather than, and this is where you sort of get led down a path as a layperson, thinking about it uh, pure in terms of it being a science and therefore having a more direct connection to reality. Well, this is really interesting. And uh, I agree with a lot of that, but it's, every time we develop this kind of view, mathematics is an art, uh, we run into problems. Uh, for example, although the French and the Russians disagreed in the 1920s on the issues I'm talking about, by the 1940s or 50s, they were all in agreement again on these issues. They might have been disagreeing on other issues, but on, on these issues, they'd come together. And mathematics is, across the globe, rather highly agreed upon by mathematicians everywhere. There, there may be disagreements at moment of development, but there, a certain codification and acceptance occurs, and then there is almost universal agreement. You can always nitpick, but very large degree of agreement. Well, art's not quite that way. I mean, art, I mean, do we ever get in agreement on schools of art? I, I'm not sure we ever do. So I'm not willing to go down that path all the way. I, there's something artistic about mathematics, but is mathematics simply an art? Uh, I'm doubtful. And I do. Further information about our programs and a complete archive of past Philip Tatey's events is available at philiptatey.org.